Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. Those of you watching us online, so glad that you're able to join us, inviting us into your home. We want to invite you into our home when you get an opportunity. Love for you to come and be a part with us. If you're here for the first or second time, my name is Phil Ortigo. I serve as a senior pastor here and it's good to be back. Last week, I had the opportunity with my wife and Vic LaVisca, and we had we flew to Quito, Ecuador. We have some strategic partners there, and we needed to sit down and meet with them over some issues and talk through some instruction. We needed to evaluate and um, encourage, and we had a great opportunity to do that. It was a very fast trip. We flew last Sunday morning out, and we flew in Thursday morning, and so it was a quick turnaround, and then I get back on Thursday morning. I hit the office at noon. I have a wedding rehearsal at 3.30 that afternoon. Have a wedding on Friday at 4 o'clock. Studied all day yesterday. Stand before you today to preach twice. This was a crazy week that we went through. But listen, we believe living on mission. And so we live on mission. And as Vic has mentioned, we have constantly doing mission projects all over the place and trying to prepare opportunities for you to be a part of living on mission, whether it's here or overseas. And we're excited about that, but it's good to be back. And we are coming to the conclusion of our study in the book of Revelation. And as we are coming to the conclusion, we are coming to some climax of the end of history as we start looking at Revelation chapter 19 and chapter 20. So if you have your Bibles, your devices, open to Revelation 19 and 20. We're going to be covering these two chapters today. These are some exciting chapters, and we're going to lay it out in three specific ways as we work through this. Now, I just want to remind you that the book of Revelation is a letter. It was written to a group of churches in Asia, which were seven churches total. The Apostle John is writing this as the Lord Jesus is dictating and giving him the instruction for this. And these believers in those seven churches were going through great times of persecution. Under the evil emperor of Domitian, the church had never seen persecution like it had in that time, in 96 AD. And so that letter was written to encourage them. That letter was written to exhort them to be bold, to be courageous, to stay in the fight. That letter was written to drive them to the place of worshiping Jesus the King. And in that letter, as he continues to do that and encourages them all throughout, we find that chapter 6 to 16 are all about the judgments that are going to come that will bring in the end of history. And all of those judgments can be seen in a, just this little telescope of a graphic that we have for you. And, and this helps us to understand how all of this unfolds through the book of Revelation. In chapter 6, we begin with the seven seals where Jesus takes the scroll and he begins to open the seven seals. When he gets to the sixth seal, there is an interlude, a time of quietness in heaven. Then when he opens the seventh seal, it leads to the seven trumpets. And when he gets to the sixth trumpet, there is another interlude. But the seven trumpets lead to the seven bowl judgments. And the seven bowl judgments are the worst wrath of God poured out on humanity. And there is no interlude during that point. And then we get to chapter 17 and 18. And last week, Jeff Poteet brought a message um, breaking that down to help us to understand what Babylon is and how Babylon is so enticing and so tempting and so alluring. He did a wonderful job in helping us to see to stay away from the temptations of Babylon. And he had that little illustration with some scandalous Barbie dolls. I, I saw that online while I'm in a hotel in Quito. And I'm thinking, I can't even get away with that. But now we've come to chapter 19 and there's a, there's a contrast. As you've been looking at the destruction of Babylon and the world systems and you're peering into all of this, suddenly there's a contrast and we're taking into the portals of heaven. And there we hear all of heaven with this hallelujah chorus, worshiping God. And today we're going to take chapter 19 and chapter 20 and we're going to look at three things today. I'm just going to give them to you on the outset, okay? We're going to look at the first thing that we're going to look at is going to be a glorious meal. 
We're going to look at this wonderful meal for the people of God in heaven. Then we're going to look at a complete massacre. And we're going to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he is going to do to our enemy and the enemy of our souls. And then we're going to look at a mysterious millennium. And that is in chapter 20. That's a lot for us to look at this morning. So I'm going to try to take it and move pretty quickly through these things to help us to see. Two of these things are going to be very encouraging to us. One is going to be very confusing to us and has been confusing through the church for ages. So here's where we're going to begin. We're going to begin with a glorious meal. And this is found in verses 6 through 9. And when we look into this hallelujah chorus, the next thing we see is the people of God gathered together in a wonderful celebration. And this is how John captures it. He says, And I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. The word hallelujah only appears in the book of Revelation. And it appears four times, and it means praise the Lord. It seems as though all the way to the end of the Bible, we wait until we get to the book of Revelation where this song is sung. Hallelujah. Praising the Lord. He continues on. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saint. And the angel, continue, said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What a glorious meal is going to take place in heaven. And this is a picture of a celebration of a wedding. And you know what weddings are like. I just did a wedding Friday. And we have the ceremony and all the guests are there. And then after the ceremony, everybody goes into the meeting hall and to the reception place. And there we're gathered at tables and we're celebrating the marriage of a man and a woman. And this is a picture of a celebration in heaven where the body of Christ is met with the Lord Jesus. And we are invited to a table to feast with him. Now, it's only fitting that the book of Revelation ends with a meal like this. Because all through the Bible, we see God using a meal to form and to shape, to encourage a time of intimacy, a time of provision, and a time of victory. We see it all through the Bible. Let me give you some illustrations. First of all, there's the Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, we see that this was a celebration because the angel of death, the last of the ten plagues, was about to pass over Egypt. And they were to take this lamb and slaughter it and take the blood and put it on the lentils of the door. And the family was to gather around the table. And they were to eat herbs, bitter herbs, kind of like some of you eating kale, you know. And, uh, and, and, and they ate the, the, the lamb and the family gathered around the table while chaos was all around them. While this angel of death was coming around, God is saying to them, here, here, sit here. But, 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 but what's happening out there? Oh, don't worry about what's happening out here. You sit with me. Sit with me. Quiet your heart. I provided this meal for you. And in the midst of it is a picture of intimacy and provision and protection and victory. And then we see it again in the 23rd Psalm. And you know the 23rd Psalm so well. This is a beautiful reflection of what's happening in chapter 19 of Revelation. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He steals my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Listen. Because you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. There it is again. In the presence of my enemies, while things are flying around, the Lord prepares a table for us and he invites us to come into fellowship with him. Again, he says, here's a chair, pull it on up. But, but I can't look at the fiery darts, look at the arrows. Oh, oh, those little things, don't worry about that, I've got it. You just sit here, you be with me. And then we see it in the Lord's Supper, Luke chapter 22. 
The disciples gather together in the upper room and they're with Jesus and he's about to be arrested and he's going to go through trials and be crucified. They have no idea that what is going to happen, but Jesus does. And what does he do? He institutes a meal. And they're at the table with the Lord Jesus. He is the host of the meal. And all that is about to go crazy, he's invited them to his presence. And then here in Revelation, the devil is about to attack. And then what we see are the thrones of heaven around a table in the presence of God. You know what's interesting about every one of these meals? Every single one of these meals, go back, every single one of these meals happens just before the defeat of Satan. Every one of them. And what Jesus is saying to us is we need to learn to sit at his presence. It's in the midst of all of these meals while there are crazy things going around. There's destruction that's happening. And the father is saying, don't worry about those things. I've got that. That's not what's important. Here's what's important. Sit right here. Sit with me. But, but Lord, I don't have the proper clothing. Oh, 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 here's the white linen of my righteousness. Well, I, I don't have the right credentials. Oh, oh, here's the blood of my son. You come and you sit with me. And you let me take care of everything. We don't live in a culture that's built for sitting, do we? We don't live in a culture that's built for resting. We live in a crazy culture. We live in a culture that's built for speed. Have you noticed that? And so many of our families don't even sit around a table and eat anymore. We eat through the drive through at Chick-fil-A. Hey, kids, hurry up, eat that. Oh, shut up. We got to get to the soccer game. We don't even rest. We eat on the go. We eat in front of the television set. And sometimes we don't eat at all. We're in such a hurry that we miss the importance of feasting. And I believe that we live in such a culture today that so many, the reason that so many of us are famished is because we don't take time to feast at the table of the Lord. Amen. We don't take time to feast with him. And every day he calls us. We don't have to wait to heaven for this great celebration. Every day the Lord Jesus is calling us to sit in his presence and to quiet our souls and to let him show us that we already have the victory. Let him give us the provisions of our lives where I can rest in him and let his hands of protection wash over me. Some of you are famished today because it's been a long time since you've sat at the feet of your Savior. Some of you are famished because it's been a long time since you've sat in his word. Some of you are famished because it's been a long time since you felt the presence of the Spirit of God. And I want to tell you, intimacy is always destroyed by hurriedness. It always is. And God is calling us to sit at the table. You know what's happening this week on Thursday? What is it? Yeah. What do we gather around on Thanksgiving? A table. And we're around a meal. Let me tell you, let me encourage you to do something this week. As you're with your family, would you sit at the table and let the Lord Jesus be the meal? Now, I'm not saying don't eat, because <laughs> I'm going to eat. But what I'm saying is this. Let him be the meal. Take time around the table with your family and just talk about all the good things that God is doing. Talk about the testimonies of your life. Be able to share the goodness and the blessings of what Lord, the Lord Jesus is doing in you. And as a family, focus on him as you pull up to the table and you rest. And if there's some that you know who are single and don't have a place to go, invite them to your home. And let them experience this thing of hospitality. That's why small groups and homes are so important in the life of our church. Because we sit around tables, we sit around circles, we sit in the presence of God, and we get to share what he's doing in our lives. And this is a glorious meal. And one day, all of us, the people of God, will be at that wedding feast of the Lamb. And we will be the bride. And we will enjoy the great celebration, but don't wait until then because there's a table now that he calls you to.
See, that's a glorious meal. But here's the second thing. There is a complete massacre. Now, you might say, that's kind of a strange point. But this is what we need to understand. There is going to be a complete massacre. What we find in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 and following, is what's known as the second return of Christ. This is going to be a glorious time. This is going to be the fulfillment of the promise of Christ. This is what we've been looking for all through the book of Revelation. And now we come to chapter 19. And here comes Jesus Christ. And the picture here is one of the most glorious pictures that could ever have been written down about who Jesus is. It's a beautiful description of who he is. And John captures it beautifully for us. He begins in verse 11. He says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Now, in chapter 6, we saw a rider on a white horse, but that was the Antichrist. He was coming to deceive the world. He was coming to lie. The rider on this horse is the Lord Jesus himself. And what is he like? He's sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Jesus is faithful. He is true. He can be trusted in everything he says and he does. And he comes as a warrior to make war. The first time Jesus came into Jerusalem, he was riding on a donkey. And he came in humbly. The next time he comes, he's on a war horse. And he is going to be the warrior. And this is the kind of savior we need because we people tend to think of Jesus in two terms, either a little baby in a manger or a Hollywood Jesus with feathered hair. And he is neither of those. When he comes back this next time, he is going to be a conquering warrior and he will be the judge. He goes on. His eyes are like a flame of fire. That means he sees everything. Nothing escapes his penetrating understanding of every human heart. And on his head are many diadems. Now, that's a crown. We see this often in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 12, Satan has seven diadems or crowns. And we see that in chapter 13, that the Antichrist has 10 diadems or crowns. And they have these, and they're posing as authorities and kingships. But they are not true authority and kingship. Here it says Jesus has many diadems. There's no limit to it. And while Satan and the Antichrist has a limit to their authority, the Lord Jesus has no limits. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And we see that in verse 16. Where it's written on his robe, it's tattooed on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But here's another thing. There's a name that no one knows but himself. No one knows but himself. Now, this is what gets me. So many people want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that name is. We've just been told no one knows it but Jesus. John doesn't know it. John didn't write a name that no one knows but himself and the disciple that he loved. He didn't say that. And so you're wasting your time when you're trying to figure out what this name could be. And here's the wonderful picture of this. There's so much mystery that we don't know about the Lord Jesus and about the glory of God. And this is a beautiful thing because we think we know a lot of things. But when we get into heaven, we're going to see glory. We're going to see the majesty of God in a way that we have never even thought about. And the mysteries that we're going to experience there are going to blow our minds. It's going to be far greater than anything you can think on earth. Then he goes on. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Scholars wonder, is that his blood or is the blood of the saints? I think it's both. It's the blood of a battered lamb, as we've seen earlier who gave his own life, but it's also mingled with the blood of those martyrs and those who have died. And it's a beautiful picture that we are hidden away in Christ Jesus. He's also called the Word of God. John says this in his prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is the living Word. He goes on. He says, And armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him, on white horses. 
Now, this is interesting. This is the armies of heaven, which include the angelic beings and the people of God, the church, the body of Christ, all with him coming in the clouds and coming back. And here's the picture. The picture is they're on white horses. The only people who wore, rode white horses were victors. And not only that, they're wearing linen. You don't go to battle in linen. You, don't, you go to battle in armor. And they're following behind the Lord Jesus, which says the victory is already claimed. And then what we see, it goes on in verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. A sword comes out of his mouth. Referring to the word of God. Now, this is the picture of Jesus as he's coming back. He's coming in the clouds with those of us behind him and the angels and the armies of heaven. And he is in front. We are following him. And then what happens next in the preceding verses is what is known as the Battle of Armageddon. We see it in chapter 16, verse 16. And this Battle of Armageddon takes place. And yet, here's the interesting thing. Satan has gone and he's deceived the nations. The, the, the Antichrist and the beast are in there. The, the, the Antichrist and the false prophet have deceived the nations. They've raised up the people to fight against Almighty God. And when Jesus comes, here's the interesting thing about the battle. There's nothing that is ever said about a strategy. There's nothing that's said about we're going to flank them. There's nothing that's said about the crashing of swords. Why? It's really not a battle, it's a massacre. Because with one word, everything is done. And we don't do a thing. We are behind him. He is the one that speaks. He's the one that takes care of it. And in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, he wipes out all the demonic forces. He takes the beast and he throws him into the pit of fire. He takes the Antichrist and he's thrown into the pit of fire. And all the people of the world who are sinful and running against and attacking and rejecting Christ are wiped out with a single word. And you and I don't do a thing. Jesus does it all. In fact, hasn't he always been doing it all? He's the one who made you. He's the one who drawn you to himself. He's the one that went to the cross and died for you. He's the one that paid the wrath, satisfied the wrath of God on your behalf. He's done everything for us. I love the old hymn, A Mighty Fortress. It was written by Martin Luther. And here's what he says. The prince of darkness grim... We tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. You see, the thing is this. We look and we think about the authorities of the world are so significant. We think about the powers all around us, and we think that they have great control. But they have nothing that has not been given to them, and no one can compare to the authority of the Lord Jesus. It will be a massacre. So here's what happens. We see that the Antichrist, and we see that the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. The church has come back with Christ. He has destroyed it all. And then we come to chapter 20. And chapter 20 has been one of the most difficult passages and most confusing things that we've seen in the book of Revelation. And it's what I refer to as a mysterious millennium. This is a mysterious millennium. We're talking about a thousand year reign that happens. And here's, here's the thought of what happens. The Lord Jesus comes back with the church. The enemies are thrown into the, um, the fiery pit. Satan is seized by a mighty angel and is bound for a thousand years into a pit that is sealed. And for a thousand years, he cannot inflict any kind of deception on the earth. And for that thousand years, the people of God will reign with Christ. Now, when it comes to that millennium, there are a lot of different misunderstandings. 
But here's what we need to understand. Of the seven verses that we're going to read, six times it mentions a thousand-year reign. Let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit in a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. There's the first time. And threw him into a pit and shut it and sealed it over so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first uh, resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Verse 7, and when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. The thousand years is what's known as the millennium. And for centuries, the church has held to this understanding that there will be a millennium a thousand years. But while we're talking about this thousand years of peace within the church, there has been so much division over this phrase that people have divided from one another. When it comes to this issue of a thousand years, there are actually four positions that people hold when it comes to the millennium. We talked about this in the very first message, but I want to review it again for you. And here are the four positions. First of all, there's dispensational premillennialism. That means they believe that the rapture will happen before the, the millennium. And so according to dispensationists, they believe that the rapture will happen before the tribulation. They'll go to heaven. There will be the marriage feast of the Lamb. Then they'll come back with Jesus. Armageddon will take place right there. At the end of Armageddon, there will be a thousand years reign on earth with those who have been resurrected from the dead with Christ. And then at the end of the thousand years, there will be the final judgment of all people and the rewards will be given. That's called dispensational premillennialism. Now there's another position, is historic premillennialism. It's similar to that, except it believes that the, tribu- the rapture won't happen until either the middle of the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation. And the saints will go up to heaven, then they'll come back with Christ. Again, Armageddon, a thousand years, and those who have been dead apart from Christ will be resurrected and be thrown into the lake of fire, the end of all things. Historical premillennial. Then there's what's known as amillennialism. Amillennialism believes that we are presently in the millennium. And it began with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're currently in the millennium. And there's no specific meaning to thousand years except for one day is as a thousand years to the Lord. And so there's no specific time to that. And then what will happen is the second coming of Christ, the rapture, the second coming of Christ, and everything else will be happening all in one moment. And then there's the fourth position, which is called post-millennialism. They don't believe in a millennium at all. They just believe the gospel would just continue to proclaim to a point to where the culture would be so radically changed. And at the end of that, the culture will be Christ-like and Jesus will come back. Now, very few people hold to that view. Now, a lot of people will ask me, Phil, where do you fall? Do you believe that the millennium is going to be a literal thousand-year reign? Or do you believe that the millennium is figurative and we are in the millennium right now? I have to tell you, when it comes to the positions of the millennium, your pastor is totally unstable. (laughs) Because there are times where I drift and say, yeah, I believe I'm a historical premillennial. I believe we're going to go through some of the tribulation. I believe that maybe mid-trib we'll be raptured and we'll come back. But sometimes I feel like I may can be amillennial. 
that we're already in the millennium. And so I can go back and forth on that. So I'm not exactly sure. So if you want your pastor to be able to help you nail down, I am an unstable person when it comes to that. But here's the thing we need to know. When it comes to the millennium, and what does it mean? Is it going to be a literal thousand years? Is it going to be figurative? Are we in the millennium now? We don't need to divide over those issues. Let me tell you, at Scotts Hill, we do not have an official stance on where we stand. It's not that our elders have gotten together and say, this is what we are. We're not, because we differ in those things. And the second thing we need to understand is this is a secondary truth. This is not a primary truth. It's not a primary truth. The gospel is a truth that is non-negotiable. The Trinity is a truth that is non-negotiable. When we deal with the doctrines of grace, those are truths that are non-negotiable. When it comes to the millennium and the second coming, we don't really know. And because we have so many different positions, here's the wonderful thing. We can learn from one another. It's okay for us to disagree and not be heretics. And what really gets me is when people want to divide fellowship with people because they don't hold the same eschatological view as them. At the beginning of this series, when I shared some of this, a man told me, I can't come to a church that doesn't believe like I believe. And he left. Over this issue, we're not called. Let me say this. We can disagree and we can debate, but if we divide, it's sin. It's sin. And we're not to break fellowship because let me tell you what won't happen. When Jesus does come back and the body of Christ is in heaven, I'm not going to be pouting if I got it wrong. I'm not going to say, man, I can't believe that dispensationalist got it right. No, I'm not. And neither will anybody else. We'll be rejoicing and saying, you are right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah chorus. And we sing together and we don't let these things separate us. You know, through the course of history, great scholars disagreed. Augustine, Martin Luther, C. H. Spurgeon, Billy Graham. We see people like Matt Chandler. We see people like Chuck Swindoll, Je David Jeremiah, John MacArthur, John Piper. They all disagree in some areas of this. Because I believe when the Lord Jesus does come back, we'll all be like, oh, that's how it was going to do. <laughs> because in the end, when it comes to the millennium, we don't really know. But here's what we do know. He is coming back. Amen. He is coming back. And he is coming back. And now we don't know how it's going to happen. When you look at the, the flow of this chapter, it looks like, okay, that, 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 that the church is taken up. And then there's a wedding feast. And then the church comes back with Christ. And then there's the destruction of the enemy. And he's thrown into a pit. And then the end comes. There are two ways to look at the book of Revelation. It's chronological or it's cyclical. When it comes to this, we may not really know, but let me end this message with five things we do know. These are the five things we are certain of. Five things. Number one, God is sovereign. All through the book, God is sovereign. All through Revelation, we see this over and over and over again. And it seems like the, the Father wants us to know that He is in charge. Listen, it doesn't matter who's in the White House, God is sovereign. It doesn't matter who's in charge of the party or what party's in charge. God is sovereign. It doesn't matter what's happening in our culture. God is sovereign. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. God is sovereign. And God wants us to know that he is in complete control and he's got every bit of this. And we rest completely in him. Secondly, Satan is subordinate. He is defeated. You know what strikes me as interesting? In, in, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, it's, it's verse 2, it says that an angel seized Satan, wrapped him in chains, threw him in a pit, and sealed it. There is an angel that's more powerful than Satan. And he is subordinate to God. 
And he can only do what God allows him to do. But at the end of it all, he is defeated. Verse 10 of chapter 20, and a devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night. How long? Forever and ever. Satan is subordinate. Here's a third thing I know. The gospel cannot be stopped. The gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be stopped. Do you hear that? And the responsibility of the church is to take the gospel everywhere. Here's the thing. Some people say we're living in the millennium and we are to plunder the territory now. Whether that's true or not, we as a church are living in a time of grace where we can plunder our culture with the gospel message. You know, it's interesting. Jesus says the gospel will go into all the world. Then the end will come. And he also says this, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You know what that means? Gates are not an offensive weapon. They're a defensive weapon. They're meant to keep people out or to keep people in. And when the church proceeds with the gospel, we storm the gates. We storm the territory of hell. We plunder what the enemy has been trying to hold on to. And with the power of the gospel, he has no grip. You are to plunder your neighborhood with the gospel. He has no control. You are to plunder your workplace with the gospel. You are to plunder your culture with the gospel. And the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be stopped. Fourthly, Christ's return for his church is sure. He is coming back. And all things are working towards that end. And while we not, may not know with certainty when it will be or how it's going to work out, he is certainly keeping his word. And fifthly, every single person will be judged by God. This is the most sobering thing that I can say to you today. Every single person in this room will be judged by God. Now, the scripture teaches us in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and following, he says... Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. There's no place to hide. And I saw the de dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Every single one of us will be judged. If you're a child of God... You will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, your name is written in the book of life if you're a child of God. Your eternal security is there, but you will give an account of your life. You will give an account of your effectiveness as a believer and your testimony and your rewards of heaven will be based upon your faithfulness to the Lord. You're not earning your salvation. That is absolutely secured only through Jesus Christ. But you will stand before him one day and give an account of how you lived your life for him. And then those without Christ will stand before the white throne judgment. They will stand in their own sin. They will stand separated. They will stand given an account of every single thing and they will stand condemned to an eternity in hell apart from God. Every one of us, every one of us will be judged. And there's some in this room who are good church people who are thinking, well, maybe my good will outweigh my bad. It's not based upon that. 
You see, the most important thing we can ask is this. Did we put our faith in Christ's work for our redemption? Did we put our faith in Christ's work? The most important thing about eternity is what have you done with Jesus Christ? If you're a child of God and you've surrendered your life to him, the evidence of that is going to be portrayed through your lifestyle. And when you stand before the Lord Jesus, yes, you're eternally secure. But there's a book with our recorded deeds and words and thoughts that are going to be exposed. Paul talks about this in Romans and in 1 Corinthians. And that we see that we'll stand before him. But if you're without Christ, my friend, listen. It's not too late. Because the Lord Jesus is here today. And he's inviting you to the table. He's saying, here's your chair. I've got a place for you. I died for you. I took on your sins so you could be forgiven. I went to the grave so you can have life. I rose again so that you can have hope. And I stand before you today giving you the invitation to come to the table. And join me in a wedding feast for eternity. You can walk out of here today in your pride and say, I don't need that. But I want you to know, pride is the national religion of hell. And God is calling some of you to himself today. Would you come? Would you surrender? You've heard these messages over and over and the Lord is speaking to you and he's calling you right now to a place of brokenness and surrender. All you have to do today is admit that you're a sinner. Surrender your life to him as Lord and trust him as your savior. Or you turn from your sin and you turn to him, but you walk trusting Child of God, your life demonstrates a testimony. And while we do not earn heaven, Jesus has earned it for us. We are called to please the heart of him who died for us by living faithfully for him. And doing that for his glory. Because one day we will behold the Lamb and we will stand before Him and we want to do so with great joy and a hallelujah chorus that echoes through the thrones of heaven. I'm going to ask if you would stand with me. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer and we're going to close with the song. And if you're here this morning without Christ, I want to to encourage you to call out to him and surrender your life to him today. Father, thank you. Thank you. For your amazing grace. And Father, I know one day we will behold the lamb in all of his glory. And we will not even be able to express in words how magnificent and majestic that is. But Father, today we stand before you and we worship you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.